Good afternoon and welcome to the second annual Mental Health Affair. My name is Miss Margaret from KFAI Radio's Miss Margaret Live. And right now we're sitting here with our King's panel. And what I'd like to do is to have everyone up here just briefly introduce yourselves and talk about a little bit what you do um, within the community. My name is, oh, first, <laughs> thank you Margaret for having me on this panel. It's really great to be here. My name is Jihad Mohammed. I'm the CEO and founder of Minnesota Fight Club. We're certified wrestling gym and certified boxing gym. Good stuff, thank you. All right, my name is Ernest Comer III. I'm the Associate Director for the African American Leadership Forum. My name is Markevius Collier. Um, I'm a, a mental health associate and a human services technician um, with the state of Minnesota. Uh, my name is Laquan Malachi and I'm a pastor at North United Methodist Church in North Minneapolis. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I think it's especially so important to have this panel because a lot of times the conversation with men and mental health kind of gets left off the table. So that's one of the things I really want us to first talk about is, you know, in you all's opinion, what is the stigma surrounding mental health, particularly men with mental health? I said men and mental health. <laughs> mm, you want to start that one off? Here, I'll hit well, um, well, I don't, um, obviously there's, you know, a lot of, there's a negative connotation, you know, especially within the African American uh, community. Um, and I think a lot of times it comes from, you know, a lot of black men not really seeing results from, we don't really, as youth, we don't really have conversations with other gentlemen who've kind of said, well, you know, um, when I've had these kind of difficult situations, I could consult with my psychiatrist, I could read self-help books and things like that and have, you know, uh, be seen in a successful light within our community, you know? So um, that kind of creates a stigma, especially, you know, with society kind of looking at mental health as, you know, um, with a side eye, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, so it kind of creates, you know, uh, an imbalance and stuff like that, when, you know, as far as, you know, trying to address, you know, personal issues and things to that effect. It's like, how do you know what to do if you've never seen anybody do it? Mm -hmm. um, so how, you know, I didn't have any role models who I think uh, showcase healthy behaviors in terms of mental health. Uh, men take on a lot, especially like if you work and especially if you're like not a trash man and you take care of responsibilities within the household as well, um, people may struggle to find time. Um, and you know, going to therapy, particularly talk therapy, that's not the kind of thing that's an instant fix. Sometimes you have to go for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, to see results. And I think sometimes people tap out before that. Uh, and then you know, there's the general stigma of mental health in the black community uh, and even particularly in the church. I tell my church members that I go to therapy all the time. I stand up there and I tell them that if I didn't take my pill in the morning, I couldn't stand up there and be their pastor. Uh, because the more you talk about it and the more you normalize it, uh, the more you give people permission uh, to get the help they need. I, I personally think that many young black men speak on what they're talking about, uh, trauma or uh, mental health illnesses. I think it's a lot in the music. And we disregard the music because it's coming from what we think is like gangsters and stuff. But if you listen to them, they all singing the same song and they saying, I feel this pain in my body. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about trauma, you feel me? We just don't see it like that. So we just not taking a message how we, we, because we don't see them how they should be seen. I think, I think a lot of the stigma comes from fear. Um, and I believe there's a fear in our community of, for men, a fear of, uh, emotional fragility uh, because it echoes femininity and we're trying to understand 
you know, the role that we have in our family, in our community, like what does it mean to be a man? And as I grow um, and do the work of being a better man, you know, that that forces me away from the idea that I'm allowed to be um, expressive in the context of emotion. So I have to be poised, I have to be um, resilient, I have to be strong, and I have to provide. Right? Nowhere in there says I'm, it's okay for me to cry. Nowhere in there says it's okay for me to demonstrate what it looks and feels like to experience an emotion outside of um, you know, anger, really. So you know, with that, you know, we land in a circumstance where there's just no capacity for understanding what it looks like to express emotion that actually is um, in, in a healthy way. I kind of want to speak to both of you, kind of uh, gentlemen's point. Um, you know, especially like you know, changing the conversation and kind of normalizing mental health and things that it affect in ways. To one of the things I do, you know, in the hospital and I don't know in my practice on a day to day basis, is use different keywords and kind of emphasize them in a different light. You know, so now when you're looking at dealing with your mental health, maybe you're seeing yourself as brave now. Maybe you're seeing yourself as courageous. You're looking at it in a different light as far as addressing it. And I think if we start to, you know, put that in the light of, you know, you being strong that represents strength, then we're starting to change the conversation. You know what things that affect? You know, um, I know you briefly kind of touched on that thing of fear and the fear about tapping into or talking about mental health. My question, I, I told you, y'all know how to remix questions, okay, so it's not on the script. My bad, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, how did you all get over that fear, though, of being able to be open about talking about maybe your own challenges with mental health, talking about self-care? What kind of was that turning point where you decided, I'm going to be open about this and be brave about it? So um, about a year or so ago, I got a roommate. Um, and my place was a mess. It was like, it might as well have been a trash can. And after she lived there for like a month or so and helped me fix some stuff up, she was like, I think you need to go see a therapist. She's like, laziness is most often a side effect of depression. And if your house looks like this, your brain probably looks like this and you should go talk to somebody. And so I went and talked to a therapist. And I think after about, in my like fourth or fifth week of therapy, I just had a complete meltdown. Just like fell into tears. And the therapist was like, I think maybe it's time for you to consider uh, medication. And I remember feeling like so incredibly ashamed. Uh, because, you know, when you first hear that, it's so easy to feel like it means something's broken. Uh, but when you think about it, it's truly silly because if you break an arm, you get a cast, no one looks at you uh, like something's wrong. If you get a headache and take an aspirin, no one looks at you like you've done something wrong. The first morning I woke up after taking my meds, my first thought was, how stupid am I? I could have been feeling like this all along. Mm -hmm. If I knew, if I could have known what I know that first day, what I knew the rest of my life, I would have been on these medications a, a long time ago because it has only increased my quality of life. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm like over it, right? Like I'm not there yet and I can't I can't claim that I have no fear right when it comes to um, stepping into that space exploring gender roles in community when it comes to exploring even my own mental health there there are elements of those conversations that bring me pause right so I, I have to acknowledge that it, the the process is a journey I have to appreciate the journey for what it is the key is the willingness to work through it, right? So the willingness is there, and so I'm, I'm confident in my capacity to step into the work that needs to be done, but it doesn't mean I'm not worried about what the outcome's gonna be. I've never really been fearful of expressing feelings or anything like that because it's, it's never been a mystery to me. I feel like we're fearful of things that we haven't experienced or fearful of things that we uh, haven't seen others go through experiencing, but I've always had an avenue to express how I felt. You feel me? Whether it's poetry, whether it's going to the gym, hitting the bag, whatever it might be, I've always had something that made me comfortable so that when I know that I'm approaching uh, like an emotional situation or I need to get something out, I have avenues to do that. 
So there wasn't ever really any fear. It was just finding uh, places to do that. I definitely want to piggyback off what he just said, um, Jihad. I just, um, from in my personal journey, um, support has been the number one thing um, for me to address healthily. Address if that's a term. Address my mental health um, because there are certain people that I talk to that make me feel like it's okay to be ashamed. It's okay to have the emotion. I'm not saying that it's okay to stay in the emotion, but it's okay to express it here, right? Without feeling judged or anything to that effect. Get it out, okay? Now what's the plan to get better? So support has been. I think it's really interesting when you talked about um, like oftentimes laziness being a symptom of depression, but it gets overlooked and how, um, just about how we have to really kind of be committed to figuring out what those symptoms are. Because a lot of times people, they, they brush off, you're just being lazy, you just have a nasty attitude, or you just this and that, not realizing it's because that person is suffering from depression or anxiety. And then you touched a little bit on trauma earlier. And it's interesting you talked about it being like in the music and stuff, because it is a lot, especially in hip hop music, that I did not realize. And I, my question to you all is, how much do you think trauma plays into just the challenges, I would say, especially within the black community, when it comes to, to mental health or and how maybe that trauma has kind of shown up for you all? Since I spoke on trauma, I'll start with this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I can speak from my experiences. Uh, I don't like going into like crowded spaces, you feel me? I don't like going anywhere without uh, knowing where the exit is. Like, I don't like going anywhere where I can't sit with my back to the wall or like close to the door. Just because I didn't see like, that I didn't have trauma, you know, and it's like, that's, that's how it affects me. When I go somewhere, it's like, who's in here? You know, what, how, how am I getting out of here? Something go down. And that's everywhere that I go. You know, if I'm in a car, I'm like, do I really want my seatbelt on? You know, because if I flip over this bridge, am I going to get it off before, you know, I drown? Like, that, that's, the, that's, uh, that's how drama play. But the way that, again, I'm not really fearful of this stuff. I go to the YMCA and I swim every day, you know what I'm saying? So if I, if I flip out that car, I'm confident I'm gonna swim out this, you know, I'm gonna swim out the car. You know, if, uh, if I'm like fearful that somebody might attack me, I go to the gym and I hit the bag, you feel me? Like, I just address it by reinforcing my strengths. So. Um, I think the trauma is most definitely in the music, but I actually think that's a good thing, uh, simply because like most of the SoundCloud YouTube rappers you know, some of these kids are as young as like 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And for them to be rapping about the things they've seen and for it to be, if they were living in any other country than America, we would call them child soldiers, mm -hmm. right? When you got kids from Chicago and Atlanta talking about having to have a pistol to walk their little brother to school, that sounds like a war zone, mm -hmm. right? That's not normal. What, you know, what chance does that kid have to grow up into like a well-adjusted, mentally healthy adult if he has to be around that sort of trauma from the time he can walk? Uh, right, and so when they're making the music, number one, they're out, they're not out doing what they were doing, which is what they talk about in the music. So that's like always a good and healthy thing. Uh, but arts are, uh, you know, I do poetry, and I feel like every time I preach, it almost feels like a similar thing of like art and expression. And you know, like a lot of black people live in underserved communities, uh, and when there's no money, the first thing that gets cut is arts uh, because it's seen as like invaluable but you go to schools with nice little brochures and bright white faces and they have like the best fine arts programs you can have because they understand that that thing not only enriches their children but enables them to deal with the trauma they experience in the world and our communities often lack that. Malika, I also wanna speak on something that you said. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's uh, rap, I would say rap is a really big thing when we're talking about trauma, y'all, because Rap is what speaks for a lot of young black men, you feel me? So this is the voice of the trauma for the black community. So that's why I keep going back to the rapping. And I, I think it's really important that although they're expressing themselves, this is not everybody's situation like Malachi touched on, you feel me? Not everybody really out there like how they said they out there. But it's, it's important that we see that they believe that this is their reality. Do you hear me? Because it's like, y'all not y'all not really out there like that, but your mindset is that. So when you're leaving out the crib, you're not thinking about, oh, I could go be productive in this way. 
thinking about, oh, this is my reality when it really isn't. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you have to change that whole mindset. Like y'all, y'all could go experience so much more, but from listening to other people's music and then making it your own reality, only thing you're going out the uh, crib experience is like trauma. You know what I'm saying? And you're setting yourself up to like be in that mindset of trauma. You know, so that's important. I think another um, big thing that um, Jihad has actually seemed to master is being aware that this is trauma for me. You know, and a lot of black men, black women, and people in general aren't aware when there's trauma involved. And when you're not aware of it, you have no idea how to deal with it. And it definitely can snowball into something much worse than it should be, you know? But that lack of awareness is so, it, it's so tough for people in our communities and things to that effect because it's hard to teach that and it's hard, you can't get funds to teach that. And then you got to have people who got funds so you can go teach that. It's just, it's tough, you know, but it's such an important part of working your way through and processing and things to that effect. Trauma sticks to you, you know? So it's, it's um, going to be a part of who you are. It's gonna be a part of how you develop as a person. You know, when you experience something that, that that triggers something in you, that that trigger you can't un you, you're not untriggered, right? And so you you go throughout your life experiencing that and carrying that with you. So it's important to acknowledge it. It's important to understand how to navigate spaces that you encounter carrying that trauma. And you know, too often we don't do the work of even processing to understand what that looks like. It's one thing I tell kids a lot, and it's particularly important for kids so you can get them young, is that all emotions are valid emotions, right? Say that again one more time all for the people emotions, in the back. <laughs> all emotions are valid emotions, yes. right? You know, you never have to feel guilty for feeling a thing because you can't really control that. And sometimes when you can catch yourself and understand what you're feeling, uh, you can sort of like move better afterwards. You know, I always tell my people at church that like you don't have to hide any of your emotions from God. The Bible's got some pretty nasty stuff in it. He can take it. Like, it's all right, you know, let that go. Because when people repress their emotions, uh, usually what happens is they'll end up getting help until it's too late or too far down the road for it to be effective. Yeah. Nobody can know what you're feeling if you're afraid to tell people what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. yeah. A couple of things, just to piggyback off on, one of the things that I realized early, like later on in my life was that I have a right to feel the way I feel. And I found myself telling people, I got in an argument, not to go into too much of my business and everything, but I got in an argument with someone who I don't talk to now. But in the argument, I remember telling them, like, I have a right to feel this way. I don't care how you think I feel about it or, you know, you don't want me to feel this way because you're uncomfortable and you don't want to deal with it. I have a right to feel that way. And to be, and I had to be able to stand in that and, and feel powerful in saying that and just knowing I have a right to feel that way. Um, and, and to, we're talking about trauma and how we really do rock, walk around with it, and it gets triggered in different ways. And a lot of times when it's triggered for us, it's, it's seen as us being aggressive, or we get this way or this, and it's like that's that, that trauma. But one of the main things that I really picked up on that you all spoke about is with our, our young people. And is, this is kind of a yes or no question, but when you all were, let's say, in your early teens, I mean, you all have the baby faces up here, okay? But when you all were in your early teens, did anyone talk to you about trauma to anyone? Did you even hear the word trauma to really know what that that how you know what that means and how that would show up for you? Yeah, this was also off script. My absolutely bad. not, absolutely not. And when you heard about it, it was for people who were in the military, mm -hmm. you know, post traumatic people who had you know going through you know our our situations were looked at as unique, mm. or we got different keywords. You know, it wasn't looked at something that should even be addressed. It was more of our way of life. I think our biggest traumatic is struggle. That's our word right there. We we struggling. That's trauma. <laughs> help, help, help. <laughs> I had certainly never heard of like mental health and mental health care mentioned in a positive life, like at all. At least until I was like well into my twenties. Uh, like I never got any of that. That therapy might be good for you growing up.
I know I'd be remixing questions and stuff. I, I, I need to put out a whole mixtape of my questions that I remix. Um, look, I'm like, what, what, what was the question? No, but I was talking about trauma and how, you know, did anyone ever sit down, like when you're like in your early teens and stuff and, and, and talk about trauma? I know no one did for me. I had no, I didn't start talking about trauma until maybe a couple of years ago. Did anyone have that conversation with you or said, maybe this is a symptom of that? As a, as a teen, the, the trauma was passed on to me. So we, we went around and we did traumatizing stuff. That's why I got That's what I'm trying to say. Like your mindset when you leave the crib is a big is a big influencer on your perspective. You know what I'm saying? Your perspective is a big influencer on how you how you look at things in your life. Cause I went out thinking that it was my normal life to do the things that I was doing. Really, it wasn't. And I had people above me, like older than me. They weren't above me. That uh, that was showing me like, you know, do this. You know, do this. Do this. It's cool. You know, this this is all right. Stealing from stores, that, that's cool. No, really, we was hungry and we needed something to eat. You know what I'm saying? It's really not cool, but now when I see kids stealing from the stores, I'm like, oh, that, that's not normal. But back then, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to take these chips real quick. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to grab some now or later. So I'm going to grab these. Boom, we out the store. You feel me? So, like you're saying, with the struggle, it's like just going out the crib and, and how you're thinking about stuff is it's not really it's your way of life it's not really trauma at that time but when you get older and you realize that you could buy stuff with a dollar or two dollars you be like dang i was really down there like that okay that's that's crazy yeah i don't i don't remember conversations around trauma specifically um but you know we get creative with our language and so you know there were conversations about the things that our family experienced and the impact that it had on our family. We didn't call it trauma, but we, we recognized the impact that it had. Um, so, you know, while the conversations that weren't necessarily, um, I guess, positioned in, in the way of saying like, you know, our family is this way because of this thing, there was some insight shared about, you know, things that happened historically that put us in the position to understand for me, you know, as a child, to better understand why we do things the way we do things. And yeah, speaking on that, I ain't know nothing about um, like the black history and how we were put down. You know, what I'm saying for for so long, I ain't know nothing about that. You know, I knew about the presidents and all that type of stuff, but I never knew why I was in this economic class, why I was socially oppressed. You know, this way, or or why you know I was looked at this way. It, that never clicked to me, you know. I just knew it was my place. I knew I was doing what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. There was no bigger picture. I kind of want to just touch on it really quick. And, you know, uh, Jihad talked about um, trauma passed down, and we talked about the lingo, and we're talking about history and all that, you know, stuff. And, you know, I spoke earlier about results. and You know, how exactly, how do we even know what a mentally healthy black person looks like what do they do no where point. are what they right. yeah what what Find us. because and you know what this is gonna get this is wild here every time there's people who are stepping in the right direction that be look mentally healthy because we don't understand it or know what it looks like now we're labeling it as what's wrong with Jaden Smith What's wrong with Willow? Why do they act like that? We're putting, then we start to transfer the, the stigma or pass down more of the trauma because we have no idea. So kind of piggy, piggybacking off of that is just about, you know, we're talking about, you know, us, our kind of growing up experience and right, not having that blueprint, not having that to look at someone and say, okay, this is what I guess that would look like. What are the conversations that you all think we should be having or that you have had, you know, with our young people about trauma, about mental health, about self care? What do you wish somebody would have said to you? I often think of that on my show. What do I wish someone would have said to me that looked like me, that sounded like me, that would have made me feel better about dealing with my own mental health challenges? One, I, I would start by saying like, reserve yourself and reserve your space. Young black men, we, we think that we gotta give out our bodies one, first and foremost. We think that uh, being, being sexual is a way to express how we feel. And it's really not, you're giving away a lot of yourself, you know, so reserve space for yourself, reserve uh, reserve your whole being, respect yourself, you know what I'm saying? 
And then on top of that, do, start doing uh, start doing things that are healthy. So simple things like going on walks. You know what I'm saying? Doing push-ups in the morning. Uh, writing down how you feel in the notebook. You ain't even got to tell nobody. Just really making space or making a routine for yourself that boosts how you feel throughout the day. And then make it make it so that it is a routine. Do it just every day, every day, every day. And you'll and you'll see that you start to feel better. You know, and it's and it's simple stuff. Brush your teeth. Wash your face. You you'll be surprised how many you know men wake up and just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so brush your teeth, wash your face. You know what I'm saying? Get your hair cut every week. You know, uh, you know if your nails get long and you know have somebody trim them or trim them yourself. You know, uh, get new socks, uh, new t-shirts. No, for real though. Get new underwear and just take care of yourself. Simple stuff. Real simple stuff. I wish someone had told me that, like, it's okay to feel good. I look back at my teenage years. When I was growing up, I hated to shower. That's a telltale sign of depression when a person doesn't want to shower. You know why? Because showers make you feel good. And sometimes you don't want to feel good or you don't feel like you deserve to feel good. I never wanted to clean my room. My place was always in clutter. It's another sign of depression because in my mind, I don't deserve a clean room, right? So I wish someone had told me that you deserve to feel better, right? There's nothing wrong with you feeling good, that you should take a shower because it'll make you feel better, that you should go to the gym because it will make you feel better. That's why I get up and go to the gym, not because I love waking up at 5.30 a.m., but I know that if I get up and go, I'll feel better for the rest of the day and the rest of the week. You have to do whatever you have to do to keep yourself in a healthy mindset. And I just wish I'd had someone to show me uh, these things growing up because the road is really rough when you have to learn that on your own. And now, on top of that, real quick, set goals for yourself, too. So daily goals and weekly goals. And then stay on top of them. Because when you leave the crib, again, your perspective on what you're doing and why you're leaving the crib is so important. You got you to gotta leave the crib, boom. Okay, I'm heading straight here, 9.30, here, 11.30, there, 12.30. And then I'm back in the crib because that's all I have to do for today. That's my goals. You feel me? And then you'll, you'll notice your life just starts to just take a whole different avenue. You'll be like, dang, this is, this is a whole new lifestyle. You feel me? I'm not going out here recklessly looking for trauma, you know? That's how, that's when it switched for me. I started realizing, boom, boom, boom. You know. Also celebrate those goals. I don't know the baby, the baby steps, the small stuff. You know, we get very, we get. It's, I don't know. There's probably a lot of people. You know, I know a lot of professionals, but a lot of business owners and things that affect. We get so caught up in the end goal or the next and all that stuff. Celebrate what you did today. I'm so proud just to be sitting here having this conversation and trying to push a positive mindset forward for not only myself, but for my people, for, for my community. Celebrate the small. Thanks. I wish, um, I wish there was more balance in valuing uh, self-care and collective well-being. Right, so there's, in our community, at least my experience has been, um, as long as the family good, it doesn't really matter what's happening with me, right? And so I'm constantly in a state of self-sacrifice mm -hmm. for the greater good without recognizing the value that I can contribute to the collective is depleted because I'm not whole, mm -hmm. right? So if I can be whole, if I can be healthy, then I can contribute in a more effective way and in, that positively impacts the collective. But, you know, my experience in life was always, you know, that, you know, I don't need to have nice things. I don't need to, you know, whatever, have, uh, you know, luxurious experiences or anything like that. I don't need to um, benefit to that degree because it's more important that I give up those opportunities so that I can be um, you know, a sacrificial lamb for the well-being of the collective, whether that's family, whether that's community, whether that's neighborhood, whatever. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I don't even want to, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> Was that a light bulb moment? Well, I'm gonna be Oprah for a second. Light bulb moment. Because as a man, that's all you're taught. You're taught to be a sufferer, the ultimate sufferer. You know, even, even in your marriage, happy wife, happy life. 
that, I mean, I want her to be happy, but at my expense? That's not, but whatever, we're not, we're not about them. That's a different panel yeah, for a different day. Got, a different expo. I ain't even got no wife, and she already in trouble, so whatever. <laughs> um, uh, I was having, I'm still having trouble answering this question because my parents tried to inform me of stuff as I was coming up, and I'm not a, you can tell me something. You have to do it. You have to be walking in it. For me to like really take hold to what you're saying, you know, and, and, and things to that effect. So I wish that there were, that my parents just, were just more educated about mental health to the point where they wanted to introduce me to it. You know, we ain't even, that's not something that we talked about. We didn't even handle situations great. If you broke your leg, we would joke about your leg being broke for God knows how long, and then you would laugh, and then we'd all be better. It's, you know, we would laugh our pain through our pain and things to that effect. So, you know, just the education part of it would have been awesome. Well, there are so many things. I don't know where to start, but one, like you said, it is, it is interesting just the point of when we talk about laughing through our pain and kind of laughing about our pain, I think we kind of use it as a way of our own survival you know, mechanisms or kind of our, our therapy, because if we can laugh about it, we can get through it. But we don't deal with it. And a lot of times people laugh, but they're not really laughing. You know what I mean? They're, they're actually hurting, and they're laughing because everybody else is laughing, and we don't want to be that outcast. We don't want to be the person to say, no, this hurts, because we don't want people to look at us and be like, uh, leave them over there, you know? And, and right about setting those goals, doing things, get up, going to the gym, and, and I deserve that. I deserve to feel better. And I know for me, you talk about celebrating yourself. People tell me that a lot, like, stop downplaying yourself. You always, you always downplay yourself. You always are like, yeah, I'm here, but I could be. Or no, don't, 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 don't say you're doing, I'm doing all this because I'm really, you know, and, and, and we, we do that a lot. Um, my kind of, I guess, last question for you all is how important has it been for you all to have a, a, that support system? You kind of briefly touched on a support system, having that, that brotherhood, people that you can talk about uh, mental health with, challenges of mental health. Um, well, for me, and more so, more so recently, um, working in the mental health field has changed my life dramatically. Um, because the things that I was teaching, I started learning, and then I started applying, and then <laughs> I started doing, and all, all this stuff, and I could, I'm so passionate about it now because of what it's done for me personally. You know, and we were talking about being whole and things to that effect, and I was talking about gaining the education. So those two things kind of came together for me, and I'm like striking, you know, I love it, you know, and things, um, and things to that effect. But recently, more so, the support has been so important because I can open up, especially with my family, my brother. I can talk to him about anything under the sun. And we're not even talking about mental health specifically. We're just, we could shoot the breeze. Or I can talk to him about something deep, dark, and personal and not feel ashamed and not feel like, you know, you shouldn't feel this emotion and things to that effect. And for some reason, it empowers me so much, right, when I go back out into the world. Just having that, if I fall or if I'm hurting or if I'm in pain, somebody cares. You know, and it's been hard. I've been actually trying to make, create a network here like that with, with, with men. It's hard. We all got jobs. We ain't got time. You know, but it's just, it's so important, I think, if we're going to push this envelope forward, creating that support, having these spaces and feeling like there's no shame. There's nothing I can't say to you, you know. Um, so for the first part, so I grew up in small town, South Carolina. I've known my best friend since we were three years old, this is my entire life. Uh, he lives in Virginia now, and now I live here in Minnesota, but we still keep in touch. And, you know, that's the type of brotherhood that you can't make up. That's something natural that we're just lucky to have. And he and I and a core group of friends, you know, we were all stuck uh, together growing up. And while we should not necessarily view enduring trauma as like some sort of goal or accomplishment, sometimes you don't have a choice but to endure. It helps to have people who to endure with. And, you know, now that we're all older, we're all trying to model healthier behaviors uh, because kids don't do what we say, they do what we do, right? You know? 
Uh, if I tell the kid they need to go to the gym every morning, that's going to hold no way if they know I'm just sitting on the couch. Um, right. So you, you know you have to model healthy behaviors so that you can provide the example to young people coming up that you didn't necessarily have uh, when you were a kid. I've, I've had to make conscious decisions about um, who I allow into my circle. Um, and the, the realization of that didn't come until later in life, as you move into adulthood, you realize your best friends growing up have a lot of things that they need to work through individually, and you need to allow them space to do that. If you don't, you continue to enable them to stay in that same state. So there are a number of friends, real close friends of mine, who it broke my heart to step away from them, but I had to make the decision to do that in order to protect my own well-being, in order to allow them the opportunity to grow into who they could be, right? So there's, there's that piece of it. Uh, but outside of that, you know, on the flip side, is connecting with people, you know, on purpose, with purpose, you know, so that we can all strive for something, right? Strive for greater or what have you. But, you know, to your point about the the realness of the conversations that you get to have when you have a, a, a group of people like that, man, it's, I mean, it's invaluable. There's no way you can put a price on it um, to be able to have conversations about, man, why my uncle always come with a new cousin that's older than me? I ain't never... Wow. It's, it's always somebody new coming to the family reunion. <laughs> like, every year they got a new cousin? Like, how they do that? You know what I mean? And now you start to have... As you grow into adulthood, real conversations about, oh, that's they mom, that's they mom over mm -hmm. there. We don't really talk to this one over here, but this is why, this is what happened with this situation. When you can have more real conversations about that, you better understand what brought your family and your core collective of who you are, your everybody, what brought your everybody to the state that they're in, right? As you, as you build that understanding, it helps you understand how to move, how to navigate so that you can you know, make better decisions. Yeah, I agree. I think support systems are very, very important. Uh, but I think the best support system is yourself. Uh, so take a lot of time to yourself and just really get to know yourself without no influences of nobody. You know? And then you know, always have somebody to listen to you, but reach out only when you are confident in what you're doing is for you. you know, like, Everything that you got to do got to be for you, and then you can help others. Because you cannot, somebody cannot be what they're meant to be to you if you're not meant to be what you are to yourself. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Like, the relation just won't work. You got to be real with yourself, and then you could go look for support with others. So I think, um, I think not leaning on people and realizing that if this person is gone, I can still stand is really important. So get, get support systems, but then also, also just... Uh, Realize that you don't give yourself away. Don't give parts of yourself away and lean on people too much. Yeah, I heard someone speak a little bit ago about like forgiveness, which is something the church pushes a lot. But I have to tell people that you can forgive someone and never allow that person into your space again. Yeah. You know, forgiveness does not equal access. It's something that's necessary for your own eventual healing when you can get to it. You know, nobody has a right uh, to be in your life and ruin your peace of mind, nobody, not even your parents. And I know, and not even your parents, because you know that's, I know a lot of people who have toxic relationships with close friends and family, but feel like because they're close friends and family, they can't cut them off, even if they know that that's what's good for you. Because you know, if they get their life together, they will realize in the long run that you were doing the healthy thing, right? right. You, you have to have peace of mind. And anybody who hinders that, it's more than okay to cut them out. You know, right? We, we talked about that a lot, even you know, with our with our previous panel about you know support system and and just you know one thing is that and how do you how do you find that that system? One of the things that helped me, I attended a conference a few years ago, and they it was a, it was a workshop we were doing. They asked us, I can't remember how they exactly phrased it, but it was like, what does safety look like, sound like, and like smell like or feel like to you? Because usually we think of safety as far as you know, like being physically safe. You know, or, you know, am I safe in my surroundings? But it changed the way that I thought about safety. Like some people answer, and they said, safety to me um, smells like my grandmother's cooking. 
you know, it, it sounds like music or my favorite song. And so I recently had started to apply that with my friends. Am I safe with you? Do I feel safe expressing myself? And if I don't feel safe, then that's not a friendship. That's not a support. That's an acquaintance. You know, that's I might be, we cool. <laughs> you know, I see you, I see you out, you know, we kiki, we whatever, but I'm not safe with you. I don't want anyone in my life I'm not safe with. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's something that we sacrifice our safety all the time. Um, and we have to kind of think about it in, in, in different ways and get kind of creative with the ways that we're thinking about it. So I think we have time, a little bit of time to kind of open the floor for some. To, okay, we can do that. We got time to open the floor um, for some questions. So if anyone has any questions for any of our panelists up here, I'd like to do so now, or even just a comment or something that you would like to share in your own mental health journey. Yes. I, I, I want to start on this, and I, I always go back to your health. We, um, I, I'm a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that one of the best things that he's given you, the best gift that God has given you is your health. You know what I'm saying? So you got to really, your physical well-being plays a big part into your mental well-being. Yes. And for a lot of us, when we hit a certain emotion, it's cool for us to go smoke a blunt, you know what I'm saying, drink some liquor or something like that. But you got to realize that, that you just going deeper and deeper, and that's, you got to get up and just get outside. Just, just move, you know what I'm saying? Get your body, get your body working. And you will start to see that your body will release certain uh, uh, endorphins with certain uh, actions, you know, when you start doing things. And uh, yeah, so your physical well-being is very important. Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, amen. Um, I would say just kind of create more events and with things like this in mind, right? So I've gone to a lot of like open mics, and I've gone to a lot of like showcases, and. They're super empowering for black women, right? They can go to the open mic, they can voice their opinion on everything, every stretch of the imagination, right? But black men at those same events have to kind of tiptoe. You gotta be careful what you say, because you say one wrong thing about that black boy, you gonna have, you know what I'm saying? Something to that effect. So just more spaces where men could just do what we're doing right here. You know, and if that, make that the directive. You know, make make the black men that you're trying to, you know, reach feel like this is just for you. Come here, do your thing, bit dog. You know, stuff to that effect. Um, if you could offer patience, encouragement, and accountability, I think those three things would be extremely beneficial. There are other things that are internal to us that you know we got to handle that internally and manage those pieces. We got to have our faith. We got to have our willingness to get through what we need to get through. But if we can have patience, if we can have encouragement, and if we can have accountability from the people around us, that's going to help us grow. Uh, I would say just be a person or provide a place where a person can be them full selves. Uh, because if I feel like I can't be my 100% full self with you, th then you're not safe for me. You're not a safe person. Um, and people need safety in order to be able to walk out on the ledge of vulnerability. Um, and people are only going to do that with you if they feel like they can be unjudged. And, you know, I worked as a volunteer chaplain in a few prisons, one back in Atlanta and one here in Minnesota. Um, and if people don't trust you, they're not going to talk to you. And oftentimes, the people who have difficulty trusting people and talking to people, um, they're often some of the people who need help the most. So the best thing that you can do in an informal capacity is provide a space or be a person uh, that people know that they can come to and be open and honest with in their times of need because people need that. Well, I was going to just say that um, he said something about patience, and I think that's a key with you know what you're trying to do. You know, be a little bit patient with us. We um, this because it's new for us. It's new to be able to be open and for people to encourage vulnerability, you know, where you're also not looking for something in within my vulnerability, where you just want me to be better, you know, you're looking for the better side of me. So, you know, I think that is gonna be a key in, you know, what you're trying to push. Well, I would encourage you all, we don't have time for any more questions right now, 
But if you have further questions or further commentary, I would definitely encourage you all to, you know, we'll be out, I assume, kicking it in the lobby. <laughs> so you could definitely, I'm, I'm sure, come up to any one of these brothers right here and ask so many questions. Um, please give a round of applause for them for being up here and, and having time with us today. And thank you all for being a part of this moment with us. I know the key thing I took from you all, especially with having a son, you know, he's only four, but that patience thing is, is something, it really encouraging him to have patience with himself and his own emotions and his journey. So I really thank you all, and I hope this has been um, enlightening for you all as it has been for me. So, love you all. Thank you. <laughs>